Hello, you're listening to a presentation called Gear Talk, What Camera System is Best for Me? Making sense of numerous options by comparing camera systems, strengths, and weaknesses. I'm Peter Sai, and I gave this talk at the Austin Food Bloggers Alliance Photo Camp just a week ago. I'll start off by introducing myself and telling you a little bit about why I'm giving this presentation. My name is Peter Sai, and I've been into photography for over 10 years now. I have a published book of Austin photos called Austin, Texas, A Photographic Portrait. You can learn more about it at austinphotobook.com. I've also been a food blogger since 2007, and I've pretty much owned every camera system that's out there today. And I've used them for a large variety of reasons, from portrait photography to food photography, headshots, interior shots, wedding, stock photography, fashion photos, and I've even gone to New York Fashion Week and been a runway photographer. But since we're talking about food photography today, I'm scrolling through a bunch of photos I've taken over the years from my food portfolio, and these pictures were taken by nearly all of the camera systems I'm going to talk about today. So today I'll compare all of these systems for a lot of different uses, and we'll talk about your specific needs and which camera system might fit you best. So it's 2013 and the current state of the camera market is that there's so many great options out there. Too many in fact. Uh, there's so many choices that it leads to analysis paralysis and many people often don't know which one to buy. Apart from traditional camera manufacturers, we also have smartphone manufacturers in the camera game now too. And newer, more interesting camera models such as the Lytro to compare against. When people want to buy a camera, they usually have one of three different requirements. They either want to take the best pictures possible, they want a small camera that they can carry everywhere and still take good pictures, or they want an inexpensive camera, or they want all three. Well, I'm here to tell you, you can have some of these camera features, but you can't always have them all. To illustrate these trade-offs, I've made a Venn diagram of three different attributes of cameras which are image quality, price, and size and weight. So if you want the best image quality, it's going to be expensive and you're going to have a heavy camera that's quite large. If you want a cheap camera, you're probably not going to get the best image quality. And if you want a small camera, uh, you might have to s sacrifice some image. These are just generalizations, but we'll go in depth into this during this presentation. One more factor to consider that's new since 2011 is the fact that a lot of people who are active on social media want to post photos online as quickly as possible. And they've given up using traditional cameras and just use their iPhone or their Android phone so that they can upload these photos and share them with their friends immediately. We'll talk a little bit more about that and some of the ways to get your photos from a regular camera online quickly as well. In addition to those four factors we've mentioned earlier, there are some other factors we should consider when looking at which camera is best for you. These include factors like how simple is the camera to use, how fast is the camera in terms of focus speed and focus tracking. These are important if you're an event photographer or if you want to shoot sports. Uh, you also want to consider how many frames can this capture per second, say if a runner is coming straight at you or if you're a wedding photographer and you need to capture the exact moment, frames per second is pretty important. Upgrade upgradability of the camera system is also important. Uh, sometimes you buy really expensive lenses and you need to consider whether or not a new camera body that you buy will able, be able to accept these lenses you've spent a lot of money on. Build quality is another factor. Some cameras are made of solid metal and built like tanks and some are made of more flimsy plastic. And also now cameras are considered fashion accessories. So the cool factor is a deciding factor for a lot of people. Uh, there's a lot of retro camera designs that a lot of people like to carry around even if they're not going to take a lot of photos. To more easily illustrate all of the digital cameras that are available today, I've made this spectrum that covers the full range of digital cameras out there today, starting on the far left with the camera phone and going all the way to the right to more professional full-frame DSLR cameras and digital medium format cameras. So the further left you go on this spectrum, the smaller, the lighter, uh, the more convenient and the cheaper these cameras are. Uh, most importantly though, the further left you go, the lower the image quality is, and the further to the right you go, 
the better the image quality gets. But there's also the trade-offs of the better cameras having a larger size, being heavier, being less convenient, and much more expensive the further right you go. I've also included a couple of wild cards that don't really fit into the spectrum because these cameras are more novelties than anything. The first one that I want to talk about is a toy camera, which is a really cheap plastic camera that looks really cool and takes intentionally bad photos. Uh, you might know them from brand names such as Holga and Lomo, but these are the really cheap cameras that inspired the vintage retro look that Instagram photos give us today. Also in this wildcard section we have next generation 3D cameras such as the Lytro. The Lytro allows you to take photos and then after you take the picture you can change the focus point of the image so that you can throw the focus of the background in and out or change the focus point from the very front of the image towards the back. I'll give you a live demonstration of that. You can also give a somewhat limited 3D effect where you can pan the camera left and right a few degrees and it gives the objects a lot more shape. But if you're shooting with the Lytro, you're not going to get very good image quality. To simplify things for this presentation, I've kind of grouped a lot of these categories together for our image comparisons that are coming up later in this presentation. But largely camera phones and point-and-shoot cameras are pretty much equivalent now. The point and shoot's kind of dying out because camera phones are good at getting so good, so we'll lump those together. Mirrorless cameras and DSLRs, their lines are blurring together a lot now because their image quality is very similar. The only difference being that there's no mirror inside of a mirrorless camera, obviously, and a DSLR has a little bit faster response and focus time, but it does have that mirror inside of the lens. Uh, or sitting right behind the lens that makes the camera a bit bulkier. But the image quality between the mirrorless cameras and the DSLRs are almost the same. Moving up, you have a larger full-frame sensor camera that is used by more professional photographers uh, who need the very best in image quality for portraits or for weddings or whatever they want to do. Finally, we have medium format cameras, which I'm not going to talk about it all because I've only used one once ever and these cameras cost almost as much as a car. In fact, some cost a lot more than a car, twenty, thirty, forty thousand dollars $40,000. But it's, it's an option that's out there and you'll see these used in a lot of publications. A lot of Rolling Stone or Texas Monthly covers are shot with medium format cameras, so I just wanted you to be aware of them. But they do have the very best image quality out there. But they do look like bazookas when you carry them around and they're definitely not portable. Speaking of image quality, that's probably the number one factor that I hear about when people ask me which camera they should buy. Let's start off by talking about what allows a camera to take a good image. Photography is all about capturing light. In general, the more light that a camera can capture for a particular image, the better the image quality is going to be. The bigger the camera sensor, the better the pictures it's going to take. So wh why is this true? If you have a bigger sensor in a camera, that means you can capture more light per pixel. Imagine if you had a tiny camera phone with a tiny, tiny sensor, and then you compared it to a camera with a much larger sensor, maybe 10 times bigger, and they both had the same number of megapixels. Obviously, the pixels on the larger sensor are going to be much bigger, and they're going to capture a lot more light. A great analogy that I learned when I was in photo school was that if each pixel was like a bucket that captured rain in the same rainstorm and you had one bucket that was 10 times bigger than another, of course it's going to capture a lot more of the rain that's coming down. And here we can com compare the rain to light coming down on a sensor. So we have our analogy. We know that bigger sensor is better. Now let's look at some real-world comparisons of the different sensor sizes of different camera systems out there today. The smallest green box here in the lower left corner is one of the smaller sensors on a point-and-shoot camera. A camera phone sensor is actually a little bit smaller than that little green box. And the first five little boxes here are all varying sizes for different point-and-shoot cameras. 
There's not a huge amount of difference in size between all the various point-and-shoot cameras, so we can generalize and say the image quality for all point-and-shoot cameras is probably about the same. Camera phones are getting better, but they're not quite to the point of point-and-shoot cameras, but again, they're the camera that you always have, and it's good enough for most people. The yellow box is where we're entering the mirrorless camera territory, the 1-inch Nikon sensor is used in the Ashton Kutcher camera, which you might have seen commercials for on TV. It's the tiny little, usually white camera with interchangeable lenses. Moving up, we have the Micro Ford third system, which I'm a fan of. It's a system made by Panasonic and Olympus, among other camera manufacturers. But their image quality is getting closer to the, uh, the DSLR range. Moving up, we can see the relative size for the DSLR APS-C sensor that is used by Canon and Nikon and they're pretty much the same size and the Pro DSLRs that I was talking about earlier is this, the size here where it says 35 millimeter or full frame full frame meaning as large as a 35 millimeter film frame used to be and this giant gray frame that's much bigger than all the rest is the typical size of a medium format sensor this last slide will summarize what a bigger camera sensor can provide for you. Uh, going from left to right, the cameras are getting bigger and therefore the camera sensor size is getting bigger. Moving from the bottom to the top, you're getting more of what's listed, listed in the left side of the graph. You'll get more professional looking images the bigger the camera sensor size is. You'll get clearer images taken in low light. You'll get more bokeh, which is that background blur in photos that everybody loves that people associate with more professional looking photos and you'll definitely get more back aches caused by the large size and weight of larger cameras with large lenses and moving left to right mirroring the spectrum that I showed you before uh, the larger the camera size you have the bigger the camera is going to be so the smallest b camera being the one on a camera phone getting larger you have point and shoots mirrorless cameras then DSLRs then pro DSLRs couple more things to note. Times are changing and image quality on cameras is getting better all the time. Cheap cameras are getting better and better and good cameras are getting smaller and smaller. The first thing I want to point out is that every year image quality of low-end digital cameras improves so why the heck would you carry around a big camera anymore? Look at a 2007 camera phone image and compare it to an iPhone 5s camera image today. There's no comparison. Today, camera phones are as good as the point-and-shoots from back then and have largely replaced point-and-shoot cameras, as I mentioned. Mirrorless cameras offer the same DSLR-like quality in a package that's nearly half the size, but at the same time, DSLR image quality has improved as well. Professional DSLRs produce 36 megapixel images and they can nearly take pictures in the dark, but you have to ask yourself, how good is good enough and how much of a pain in the butt am I willing to put up with for great image quality. Also, do I really need to spend three or four thousand dollars on a camera if all I'm going to take pictures of is food and I don't really care about how professional my images look? Let's go into the pros and cons of each of the systems that we've talked about today. Let's start with smartphone cameras, pros and cons. Pros, the best camera, as I said, is the camera that you have with you. If you have a giant camera, that takes amazing images but you never want to carry it with you then it's useless you can't take a picture unless you have a camera the image quality of photos taken with camera phones in ideal lighting situations is good enough for most people in fact many magazines are now printing images that came from camera phones and some people might not even be able to tell the difference as I said camera phones have pretty much replaced point and shoots and they're obviously the easiest to share from and post your images to Instagram and edit with apps on the fly you can even post images from an event that you're at right then and there so that you can maximize your social media uh, benefits from posting the image first and I like to say that these camera phones are essentially free because almost everybody these days has a phone and every smartphone has a pretty decent camera on it if you've bought the phone recently. Cons for having a smartphone camera only is that there's no zoom and no interchangeable lenses on them. 
You can't really take very good pictures in low light with a camera phone and the flash that's on most camera phones is terrible. It really blows out skin tones and it makes people look green in many instances and I would just avoid using it at all costs. Also the lower picture quality on a camera phone is not so noticeable when you're looking at an image on the screen of the phone itself but if you upload it to Twitter or Instagram and look at it on a computer monitor you can really tell the image quality difference uh, between a smartphone and a DSLR. Focus speed and capture rate are pretty slow with, uh, with phones generally although that's changing. In general camera phones are mostly good for casual photos and snapshots they're not good for fast moving objects or once in a lifetime moments you're not going to shoot a track meet with Usain Bolt running straight past you and you're not going to shoot a wedding with this and not all camera phones are created equal the iPhone camera phones are typically really good some Android phones are nice but I've used, in, I've used some camera phones that I, I wouldn't ever post images from because it's, it's pretty bad the next camera systems I want to talk about are the mirrorless cameras which include micro four thirds and APS-C size sensor cameras the pros being that the image quality is pretty much the same as a DSLR only that these cameras are usually half the size and much lighter. Image quality is good enough unless you're a pro for this category of cameras. There's interchangeable lenses for them, there's good flash systems. They draw less attention when you're out in public and taking pictures and you can easily take them out to restaurants or to a dance club or to a bar and, and not really worry about people getting creeped out by this gigantic camera. There's a lot of cool and retro styling options available for mirrorless cameras and they come with a lot of cool features typically such as touch screens and tilting screens. The newer ones have Wi-Fi connectivity. Uh, they can focus a little bit closer than a DSLR can which is good for macro images and telephoto. Also you have full manual controls on most of these mirrorless cameras and you can get some of that nice background blur that people associate with professional looking photos. Cons of mirrorless cameras include that they tend to be on the pricey side for what you get. Uh, they're a little bit more expensive than DSLRs currently because they're newer and more of a novelty. The controls on these smaller cameras are obviously smaller and more cramped than they are on a DSLR. So if you have large hands, mirrorless might not be for you. Sometimes these lenses are only a little bit smaller than DSLR lenses too, even though the bodies are a lot smaller. So for micro four thirds cameras, the lenses are really small, but if you have a Sony NEX or a Fuji interchangeable mirrorless camera system, those lenses aren't a whole lot smaller than regular DSLR lenses. Focus and capture speed are a little bit slower than they are on DSLRs, but that's changing now with the new, newer generation of mirrorless cameras. Uh, as I said before, they're bad for people with big hands uh, because you can't really hold these cameras for hours at a time like you can pro DSLRs. There's currently not as many lens choices for mirrorless cameras as there are with SLRs, but as the sales of these mirrorless cameras improve, more manufacturers are creating lenses for these systems. And these image, images that come out of mirrorless cameras are near pro level images but if you need the absolute best it's not the same thing as shooting with a full frame camera in my opinion. One last system to go over before we get to our image comparison is the full frame DSLR and the pros are obvious it's got the best image quality out there of any DSLR. You can almost take photos in the dark as I mentioned before these cameras have great ergonomics because of their larger size these grips they contour the shape of your hand so you can shoot with them for hours say if you were shooting a wedding that lasted 12 hours long your hand wouldn't be in that much discomfort after you know eight or nine hours it's built like a tank a lot of these have solid metal frames that are covered in rubber so if you drop them these cameras bounce uh, they'll still work in sub-zero temperatures and they some of them can even withstand a, a light rain shower as well there's an amazing range of lenses, flashes, and accessories made by tons of third parties and companies such as Canon and Nikon. The controls are laid out for quick operation. You can customize the controls. You can shoot nine frames per second with a lot of these cameras. And the batteries in these cameras 
is a lot larger than they are in point and shoots. Usually point and shoot cameras and even mirrorless cameras die after 100 or 200 shots. These full frame DSLRs, their batteries can go for thousands of shots. And of course the image quality also comes with that beautiful background blur that people love in the images. Cons of owning a pro DSLR camera include having to carry around a giant camera that is heavy, having to pay tons of money for these and the accompanying expensive lenses. Um, a full frame camera that's top of the line right now will run you at least $3,000 and many of these lenses are also in the $1,000 range. As I said before, these cameras are large so they can be somewhat obnoxious if you want to take them out in public and a lot of people don't like having their picture taken when they know that the camera is capable of producing professional images that someone could sell. Pro DSLRs use giant lenses that weigh a lot typically. Comparing on my mirrorless setup with five lenses to my Pro DSLR setup with only one lens, these five lenses and a mirrorless camera weigh about the same as a Pro DSLR with just one lens. Also the files that DSLRs uh, with full frame sensors produce are really big and you're going to have to keep buying lots of hard drives because you can take a lot of big photos fast and you'll need a place to store them. Okay, now that we got all the pros and cons out of the way, it's the moment we've all been waiting for. Comparison images between all of these different camera systems I've talked about so that you can see the differences in image quality, which is one of the main criteria that people really care about. All of these images were taken with similar settings, with similar lenses, so you can really compare and contrast the advantages of each of these systems. Let's start this comparison off with the best image quality we can get. This image was taken in my garden with a full frame DSLR at 35 millimeters at f2.2. If you don't know what that means, just know that we're going to use the same settings across all of our camera systems here. But notice the beautiful bokeh in the background, the narrow focus on just one object in the right side of the frame. These are succulents that we have in a pot. And you can see that even though there's an obnoxious black fence in the background, it gets completely blown out by the background blur or bokeh. Transitioning into our APS-C size DSLR image, we can say that the image quality is very similar to the full frame DSLR image, although the pink flowers in the foreground are much more in focus and we can see a couple of the red succulents in the right hand of, of the frame are now in focus instead of just a single one. So we don't have as much of the out of, out of focus areas of the photo that we did with the full frame even though these images were taken with the same settings with very comparable lenses. Let's switch back and forth between the two images so you can see the subtle differences. You'll also notice that the, the black fence in the background is a little bit more prominent in the regular DSLR image. If you're saying to yourself there isn't too much of a difference between these two images, that probably means you don't need a full frame camera. These two sensors are about two and a half times different in size but for this next image you're gonna to have to brace yourself because we're gonna go from a regular DSLR quality image to a smartphone image and the size difference between those two sensors on those cameras is immense so here we go same settings similar lens different sensor on a camera phone BAM notice how the black fence in the background is completely visible now and every single plant is in focus. We don't have any of that beautiful background blur that we had before on the two DSLR cameras and you can notice a lot of grain in the photos. It's not quite so smooth or surreal looking like the images that we get out of the DSLRs. You can also see the grass that's in the backyard, you can see houses, you can even see a storm drain that weren't even there in the picture at all before. So. This is a good illustration of the different types of images that you can get out of these different classes of camera. And it's all dependent on the different sensor size on each of these cameras. Since I gave this presentation at a food bloggers photo camp, let's use some beverages as our next test subject. Here in the iPhone photo, you can see that almost all the bottles are in focus. You can read the label on the first three or four of them, and then we can clearly see the back wall and the leg of the chair behind all of the bottles. Our next photo comes from a mirrorless camera, the 
Olympus OMD Micro Four Thirds camera. As you can see, it's looking quite pro here with a lot of background blur and only the first couple of bottles you can read the label on. The others are kind of out of focus as we move further back in the frame. The following image was also taken with a mirrorless camera with an APS-C size or regular DSLR size sensor. You can see that the second bottle here is slightly more out of focus, but not by a lot. That's because the sensor difference between Micro Four Thirds and your standard APS-C sensor is only different by about 50%. Finally, we have our image taken with a full frame DSLR. Again, all of these images were taken with the same settings and a very similar lens. So the only difference here is the sensor size. And we can see with the full frame DSLR image, we have an extremely dreamy image. You can't really tell that, that the brown object on the left side of the image is the leg of a chair. And you can't really even see the baseboard of the wall in the back. The white strip there is just completely blurred out. We have beautiful bokeh in this image. Getting back to the sensor size discussion that we've had today, the full frame camera sensor is obviously the largest one that we've looked at today. It's about two and a half times bigger than the sensor on a regular DSLR camera. It's about four times bigger than a Micro Four Thirds camera sensor, and it's a whopping 55 times bigger than an iPhone 5 camera sensor. So you can see the difference in the photos. Walking back through the different images from the different cameras, in this demonstration, you can start to see the differences in image quality and the amount of bokeh that we get in each of the images. So it's really up to you which camera you want to get, uh, weigh the pluses and the minuses, and then look at the image quality and see which one fits you. Wrapping up on the comparison between Pro DSLR, mirrorless cameras, and smartphone, and getting back to that Venn diagram that I showed you earlier. I have a feeling that most of you will d agree with the chart here that Pro SLRs are the best in image quality, but they don't have the size and the weight that, or the price that a lot of people want. Mirrorless cameras are kind of a compromise. They don't have the best image quality, but they're small and they're not super expensive. Smartphones are free, but the image quality isn't so great. But it is the smallest camera out there, and it's essentially free because it comes with a smartphone. Bonus demo time, I promised that I'd show you the image quality and the different features of the Lytro. So right now you're watching me click around on a very similar image of all the Sidral bottles that I took pictures of earlier. This time I took the picture with the Lytro. And here you can see upon the playback, you can change the focus point of the image just by moving the cursor over the area that you want to come into focus. You can also do this perspective shift feature by dragging on the image and scrolling around so you kind of give get a parallax effect where you shift the angle of viewing by a couple degrees left and right. And you can also combine the two effects where you're doing the parallax and the focus change at the same time. So it's a pretty cool tool, but as you can see it's pretty low res. It's like having a old school camera phone image with 3D technology. One of the final things I wanted to go over was transferring photos from your camera to an online social media site like Instagram or Twitter or TwitPic. Earlier I talked about how the camera phone is the most convenient tool that you have to upload pictures quickly to Instagram. But there's a product out there called iFi, which is basically an SD card with a Wi-Fi chip inside of it. So you can take any regular camera, put this SD card in it, in addition to being able to store your pictures, it has the ability to serve as a Wi-Fi hotspot or it'll allow you to upload photos once you're connected to a Wi-Fi network to any computer or any smartphone. And if there's no Wi-Fi connection available, you can also create a direct link between your smartphone and your camera so you can upload the photos directly to your camera in that way. So again, the benefits of the iFi card are you can share your real photos that you've taken with a regular camera on Instagram almost instantly. It takes about 5 or 10 seconds to copy one image from the card to your smartphone. You can connect directly, as I said, or through a wireless connection that already exists. And you can choose to copy all your photos, or you can switch it to a mode where you only copy over images that you select. I've used this card a few times for 
conferences where I wanted to upload photos immediately and I've also created some photo booths where I was able to upload the pictures directly to my computer and display them to my friends maybe 10 or 15 seconds right after we took the picture. It's not without its quirks. The iFi is a little bit difficult to set up at the beginning but once you've got it working it's quite a handy tool. The last two things I want to talk about are lenses and camera lighting. There's a lot of gear involved in these two areas and as you know there's hundreds and or maybe even thousands of lens options out there in the world. Just some bullet points that I wanted to share about lenses is that zoom lenses are the most convenient but the very best image quality, professional looking image quality, comes from prime lenses. Those are lenses that do not zoom. All of the images we've been looking at today were taken with a 35 millimeter prime lens. If we were using a zoom lens, you wouldn't get quite as nice of a background blur unless you're going really expensive with the zoom lenses. We're talking thousands of dollars. And even then, the amount of background blur wouldn't be so much. You can pick up a 35 millimeter prime lens for about 300, 400 bucks. And to get that beautiful bokeh that we've been talking about in all of these images that I've been showing you, the lower the f-stop number that you have on your image, uh, the more background blur you get. And what that means is you're collecting more light the lower the f-stop number. Some lenses can collect more than others, so therefore you get these dreamy images that are, that are really cool to look at. And macro portrait lenses are Macro and portrait lenses are great examples of lenses that don't cost a whole lot of money but can give you a lot of bang for your buck. Both of these types of lenses really allow you to throw out the background and get really sharp images that are very professional looking without costing thousands of dollars. Another lens a lot of people like to get is a 50 millimeter prime lens and I know the Canon version, the 518, costs about $100 and a lot of people love the results from it. Great glass can be very expensive, but it holds its value over time. Sometimes the price even goes up if there's high demand for a lens, but there's a low supply. And sometimes when the value of the dollar goes down, the value of your lenses will actually go up. A lot of people say to invest in great lenses because these great lenses can be used on any compatible camera body. So you can upgrade your camera and take over these great lenses that you're used to using and you can enjoy them for many years in the future no matter what new technology comes along. As I mentioned earlier, lenses really add to the weight of the gear that you're carrying around. So depending on the size of the camera that you have, it determines the size and the weight of the lenses. So if you're carrying around a lot of full frame lenses, it's going to be really heavy and your back's going to get really sore if you're going to carry it around for any length of time. That said, the mirrorless cameras, such as the Micro Four Thirds camera that I like a lot, if you have three Micro Four Thirds lenses, it's about equivalent in size and weight to that of a Pro DSLR lens. And one other thing that we should note, on the price side, good lenses are often more expensive than the camera. It's not uncommon to see thousand or even two thousand dollar lenses if you go for the pro quality glass. Finally, the last slide is about lights. There's three different kinds of lights that you can get to supplement your photography. Uh, these are studio strobes, speed lights, which are these portable flashes that you see on top of professional DSLRs, and there's continuous lighting, either fluorescent lighting or LED lights that have become really popular. Most food photography looks best when it's lit by natural light. Usually the larger the light source, the better, the softer and the more natural looking light you're going to get. Portable speed light flashes are less powerful than studio lights, but you can carry them around wherever you go. Studio strobes are a little bit bigger and heavier, but they have a lot more power output than these portable flashes, and they require either a plug in the wall or a large battery pack. Reflectors are a simple alternative where you're just reflecting the light that's already existing, uh, but again, you can't create your own light uh, like you can with the other light sources. And finally, those continuous LEDs that I mentioned, they are light, portable, but sometimes they're a little bit blindingly bright or they're a weird color. If you've taken a lot of photos 
with indoor lighting and with window lighting. You'll notice that window lighting is kind of bluish in color and indoor light is usually either orange or green. If you're using some of these light sources, it's really important to match the color of the light uh, between all of your light sources to get a more natural look. Otherwise, you'll have you know, weird blue or weird orange reflections in all of your photos. Lighting is a subject that could cover a whole nother 30 minute class, so maybe someday I'll get to that. But for this camera gear class, I'm pretty much done with everything I wanted to say. Um, online, you can't really ask questions of me real time, but if you want to have any questions answered, feel free to leave a comment here and I'll try to get back to you as soon as possible. Thank you for watching and I hope you learned a lot.